Thank you, madam, for your kind words. Good afternoon and namaskar to everybody. President of the function and my dear friend, Dr. A.K. Singh, chief guest of the day, Honorable Minister for Horticulture, Government of Karnataka, Sri Muniratna, the director of the institute, and friend, dear friend, Dr. B.N.S. Murthy, all the former directors of the prestigious Indian Institute of Horticulture Research, Bangalore, all the scientists, technical officers, and other staff of the institute, the family members of all the members of IIHR, friends from media, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen, and above all, the children who may have joined. Once again, good afternoon to all of you. I would first like to thank Dr. Srinivas Murthy for inviting me to be with you this afternoon. The former director, Dr. Dinesh, had been inviting me several times. For some reason, it had not materialized. I take this opportunity to also thank Dr. Dinesh. Both of them are very well known to me and have been very active members in formulating various policies of our ministry. In fact, both of them contributed to writing extensively on the horticulture aspect of the strategy for doubling farmers' income. I am grateful to them. I am grateful to the IIHR itself. We borrowed extensively from your research findings as we drafted the horticulture component of the DFI strategy. Now, let me congratulate the Indian Institute of Horticulture Research for 55 long years of human service. Fifty-five years is a long journey, and the contributions to the fair name of the Institute today is an account of various former directors. Dr. Randhava, Dr. K. L. Chadda, they stand out as those who gave a paradigm shift to horticulture sector in the country. I would also like to recall Dr. H.B. Singh, the former DDG in the ICR in charge of horticulture, who also has made very substantive contributions to horticulture. And the present, present Deputy Director General, another friend of mine, Dr. Agnes, is equally committed to transforming the agriculture sector through the horticultural pathway. All this is possible only because each one of you and all your illustrious predecessors have worked with dedication and devotion. On this foundation day, as I wish you many, many happy returns of the day, I must share with you that however intelligent, however capable, however committed an individual may be, yet the progress will happen only when everybody works together. It is a cooperative spirit that can move mountains and make impossible things possible. It is very well said 
that collective intelligence is more powerful than individual intelligence. So the cumulative intelligence of all of you together will be making transformative changes in the domain of horticulture of our country. As Dr. Srinivas was saying, I personally believe as much as the government believes that horticulture along with the dairy and animal husbandry sector as also the fishery sector constitute the engine of, of growth of agriculture sector. It is these three which are now going to pull the agriculture growth of our country. It is these three which are going to transfer nutrition to the millions and millions of our population. It is these, these three segments which are going to contribute to the incomes of our farmers. It is these three which are going to help us in adaptation and mitigation measures arising from the climate change and the consequences. So horticulture sector, which is both seasonal in nature as well as perennial in nature, is a unique segment. And when we talk about horticulture, it is not just fruits and vegetables. There are also other aspects of horticulture that include plantations, that include floriculture, aromatics, herbal and medicinal plants. And of course, mushroom is always there, which is one of your core activity. So it is a white canvas. And I would say that there's so much more to do in the domain of research, in the domain of extension, in the domain of management practices that would not be sufficient to harvest the full potential of horticulture. Let us take the simplest example of productivity. If we compare the crop segment, the agronomic crops with horticulture, there is a humongous difference between the two in terms of average per hectare productivity. While we may be able to achieve an average of two tons per hectare in case of agronomic crops, the minimum that we can attain in horticulture is an average of 19 tons per hectare. That is only to substantiate that we will be able to create mountains of the food produce if we just focus on horticulture. Today, as you are all aware, that India has completed 74 years of independence. And we are going to celebrate the 75th year of independence. And it was in 2016, when our Honorable Prime Minister shared his vision with the people of the country, that agriculture has grown well in the country, but the farmers have not benefited to the same proportion. It is an irony that while the farmers of this country, supported by the scientists, agricultural scientists, for security of food to our nation, the nation has failed to offer income security to the farmers. Income security is very important because this is what will determine the welfare of the farming community. We are not anymore interested in subsistence economy. The period of subsistence economy is long past. We are now interested to fulfill the dreams and aspirations of our constitution. Our constitution promises everybody a quality life, a life of dignity. And the ethics says that we must ensure human dignity. How do we make this possible? The first requirement, of course, is adequacy of incomes. And therefore, when Honorable Prime Minister talked about doubling farmers' income, 
as India celebrates her 75th year of independence in 2022. The minimum we should have achieved is doubling the income of the farmers vis-a-vis -vis what existed in 2015-16. And we, in the doubling farmers income committee strategy, have very clearly talked about diversification of agriculture. Diversification, not just from the perspective of risk management, but also from the perspective of income growth. And we are confident that if we are able to diversify a part of the land that is there under the agronomic crops into horticulture and other aspects of agriculture sector, we will be able to make a paradigm shift in the average incomes of these farmers. To just give you an example, today when we compare the volume of production and the value of the production thereof, we find almost there's an inverse relationship. The pyramids will look inverse. For example, while we have 24% of our net cultivated area on just three staple crops of wheat, paddy, and maize, their value in terms of agricultural GBA just 10%. Whereas with just 15%, of the cultivated area under horticulture, the value in terms of agriculture GBA is a high of 24%. So this just illustrates that today, if we want incomes for our farmers, we have to focus on high value agriculture. And that high value agriculture comes from fruits and vegetables, and of course, other components of horticulture. They are high value for various reasons. A value is determined in terms of what does it do to the people? What does it do to the ecology? What does it do to the society? And of course, the value also depends upon the supply and demand position. Irrespective of the demand and supply position, horticulture is still considered a high value because from a nutritive perspective, it has high contents of vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. And today our farmers are not just our farmers, but our consumers as a whole are in need of nutrition. The latest health survey shows that India's nutritive status is subpar. It is another unfortunate thing that are notwithstanding the mountains of cereals that we produce in our country, notwithstanding the high adequacy of carbohydrates in our country, the people will still continue to suffer from stunted growth. They continue to suffer from various kinds of malnutrition, undernutrition, koshi worker, and other kinds of anemic diseases. We therefore are no more interested in just carbohydrate security, which is generally called as food security. We are interested in nutrition security. And when we talk of nutrition security, we must ensure that the farmers and the consumers at large get both macronutrients and micronutrients. So horticulture has that of producing both macro and micronutrients, and particularly the micronutrients. So if we want to give good health to our people, harvest the demographic dividend that India is proud of today, we must then therefore give them proper nutrition. And horticulture has that potential. Horticulture has been growing just from 18.7 million hectares in 2005-06, it has grown to 28 million hectares by now. The growth rate in terms of area is around 34%. But in terms of productivity and production, the growth rate is as high as 55%.
And that, once again, substantiate what I told you, is an account of the innate genetic potential for high productivity in case of body culture. And if we are able to shift just 1% of the area, net area, under the staple crops to horticulture, we will be adding rupees 77,000 per hectare at 2015-16 prices. That means if we are able to convert just 1% under the staple crops into horticulture, the net wealth that will create for a country every year is rupees 2,000 crore. So that is the immense potential that horticulture has got. So this is one way of creating jobs, one way of creating incomes, but there is another better way of creating greater value from horticulture and greater number of jobs. Because today India is interested in creating gainful jobs. We are aware that 48% of our population depends on agriculture directly and indirectly for jobs. Unfortunately, all these jobs are not gainful jobs. They are described mostly as underemployment or disguised unemployment. That means where one person is required, we have about two people working. That is a waste of human resources. What therefore we want today is to generate gainful employment in agriculture. And that gainful employment, once again, will come from horticulture because compared to the crop segment, the crop, the intensity of labor in horticulture is very high. It can generate 1800 man days compared to around 200 to 300 man days in a crop segment. And there are certain aspects of horticulture like plantations where it's much more intensive. Seed production is much more intensive. Now, apart from the job creation potential in the primary horticulture, the secondary horticulture, which is a component of the secondary agriculture, has much more potential to generate jobs. And secondary agriculture, which includes horticulture, means ability to primary process the primary raw produce, secondary process the primary raw produce, and further go up the value chain by subjecting that raw produce into tertiary processing. Primary processing, as you know, cleaning, grading, sorting, etc., waxing. But then when we enter the domain of physical chemical transformation, the secondary processing, or move further up to create greater value through this tertiary processing, this processing offers us immense opportunity of creating jobs and incomes. The evidence from Western society shows us that if we can process, we add three times the value to the agriculture produced generated on the farms. So the value that we calculate today in agriculture, including horticulture, can become three times. And along with that value, we also create that many number of jobs. Let us illustrate this by the extent of processing that happens in India today. India is still not known for processing. Our food processing stands at around 9% of the total produce. Non-food processing is almost nil. It is just made sm some small beginning. But within the small 9% of food processing segment, we have generated millions of jobs within the organized and the unorganized sector. Within the organized sector, we have got 1.74 million, but there are three times this generated in the unorganized sector, which only means that if we can push up our processing from 9% to 20 to 30%, we'll be creating jobs three times what we are creating today. And if we go for non-food processing, we'll be adding further to the quantum of job opportunities. So horticulture is something that is most amenable to processing. The reason being that it is a perishable commodity. Being perishable, 
it is also vulnerable to decomposition. And today, while 20% of agriculture produced in a country is decomposed and wasted, the percentage of decomposition obviously is very high in horticulture compared to the grain sector because of its perishable nature. So not only is it a necessity, but also it is advantageous for us to go in for processing. But before I speak about processing, I would like to emphasize that we do not want people to go for processed food as long as they can get fresh food. Our responsibility should therefore be to reach out of the raw produce from the farm gates to the consumption centers in a quality, uncompromised manner. Because we want people to eat or consume nutritions or nutrients that are contained in the fruits and vegetables and other kinds of horticulture produce. And that entails to put up strong agri-logistics. Agri-logistics that connects the farm gates to the consumption centers. A consumption center can be a household. It can be a processing plant. It can be export house. It can be marketed within India or outside India. But we need the vehicle of agri-logistics. We need pack houses, ripening chambers, cold storages, river vans, and so on and so forth. And of course, seamless opportunity for transportation between land, air, and water. When we are having this kind of wholesome ecosystem-based agri-logistics in our country, horticulture will automatically get incentivized for further growth. I'm not talking about the good research and technology that you will give us, which will push up and pull the, tech, the productivity. We are talking about what you already have achieved in the last 55 years. If we are able to even harvest that particular productivity potential, then we would have done great for our farmers, for our consumers, for our country. Because decomposition, releasing greenhouse gases, is a curse. We are not investing our labor and imports and management practices, science, technology into the farms to produce something to waste it as a decomposition. If we take, for example, decomposition and the greenhouse gases that emanate from it as a country in the world, it stands third after USA and China. That is a quantum of carbon dioxide equivalent that decomposed waste of agriculture produced is generating on this earth. If only we are able to stop that, check that wastage of agriculture produced through good agri-logistics, through good roads and communication, we will be not only checking the climate change to some extent, but also transferring the nutrition to our, farm, to our people. So my request to you is that today what we need is greater focus on the post-harvest management. Along with the focus on productivity, yes, along with productivity, of course, most important is to see how the self life of the shelf life of this agriculture, horticulture produce is elongated so that we as farmers, as processors, we get more time to deal with this perishable nature of produce. And therefore, the consumers are also able to consume fresh. But along with that, the greatest attention today, according to me, is on post-harvest management. What kind of technology can you actually generate? Combining the strength of biotechnology, bioprocessing, bioengineering. If we are able to combine these three along with information technology that is available with us today, we'll be able to save a lot of the horticulture produce and transfer it to our society. Transfer it as incomes for the farmers, as nutrition for the consumers, and as sustainable approach to our ecology. So I would say that there's so much that we need to do today. In this particular context, I would like to highlight that as scientists, as technologists, as policymakers concerned with science and technology, we must be now focusing on what is called science for delivery, not science for the sake of science. 
Yes, IIHR, its mandate is to focus on both basic and applied science and technology. How do we actually optimize your focus on basic science and applied science? Applied science is something which is more core according to me for our agricultural scientists. The basic science principles that can be drawn from the other traditional universities, other research centers need to be innovatively applied to, to deliver what we want today. And I must say that deliverables today are nothing but nutrition for the consumers, incomes for the farmers, and sustainable technology for the ecology. These are the three basic or the principal stakeholders of our system. Now, horticulture as such has made great progress. We have only seen in the last five years what kind of jump horticulture production has been showing. For the first time in 2013-14, the output of horticulture at 264 million tons equal that of the food grains of cereals and the pulses together. And thereafter, there has been no looking back for horticulture. We have been jumping year after year, leaving behind the food grain sector. And today, while food grains stands at 305 million tons in 2019-20, Horticulture stood at 325 million hectares, my million tons. Of this, we have got 100 million tons of fruits and 200 million tons of vegetables. And of course, the rest come and the rest account for the rest. However, within the vegetable segment, there is still greater focus on three as three components: potato, onion, and tomato. They are our principal components. But I think what we need when you talk of nutrition is other kinds of vegetables. Our women are suffering from anemia. Our children are suffering from stunted growth, wasted growth. Can we have more of those minerals and vitamins? For example, leafy vegetables, which will give transfer a lot of iron content to the women folk which are, who are in need of it. I'm only just giving an example. You need to start now looking at not just in terms of volume of production, but the generation of nutrition. In fact, I would request our DDG here also that not just about horticulture, the entire agriculture segment today, we now need to start calculating what is the total nutrition requirement of our population. Today at 131 crore and to be 150 crore soon, what would be the requirement in terms of macronutrients, in terms of micronutrients, and which would be the best crops that will give me maximum of these nutrients and I will start focusing on those things. So I think there's a different way of looking today because we want our people to be healthy. We want our people to do their, to live a best life and contribute to the societal transformation. So the science and technology today has to reorient itself according to me. A simple mind switch as to how do we make these things happen and not just look at it in terms of productivity. And of course, along with the productivity, what we need to look today because of the climate change context is the, the agroecology-based principles. We're aware that while agroecology, the lead is, it is necessary to grow a particular kind of a crop. Unfortunately, farmers don't do that because they don't get the same income from that as they would get from another crop which may not be agroecologically sound. So that is a matter of policy where we need to change our pricing policy, for example, or the subsidy policy, so that we incentivize those agroecologically synchronous crops better than what we're doing for other crops. In this particular context, the purpose of my telling this is to draw your attention to the dryland horticulture. India, as you know, is a vast country with 141 million hectares. And it is under 121 agroecologists, agroecological subregions. We have got from the temperate to the arid zone. So India, that way is a blessed country because it can grow all kinds of flora that is possible in this world. However, we have some in a way bypassed our rain-fed agriculture systems. If we're talking about agriculture growth, 
if you are talking of income growth we are also talking of equality egalitarianism we just don't want a section of the farmers to benefit and a larger section of the farmers not to benefit today if you compare the rain fed system to the irrigated systems the difference in average yield is 2 tons per hectare while well, average is 3.1 ton in case of irrigated systems it is 1.1 ton in rain fed systems so how do we now upgrade the technology and the management practices under the rain fed systems given the water scarcity given the fragility of the soils and given the high infiltration rate the shallow nature of the soils under rain fed systems and loss of organic carbon over the last few decades we need to go more for dryland horticulture within the rain fed area systems so my pleading to you today is can we first develop a horticulture policy of india and then also develop as a sub policy a dryland horticulture policy for our country because 52% of our country is under dry land or in fact let's call it a rain fed agriculture system so there are india is mostly home to tropical and subtropical horticulture species and iihr is primarily mandated to study research on tropical and subtropical crops so given the water scarcity given the need for higher productivity given the need for higher incomes and sustainability of farming under the rain fed agriculture i think iihr can play a very crucial role in developing a dryland horticulture policy for the rain fed systems of our country along with of course a larger horticulture policy we have an agriculture policy but we now need a dedicated horticulture policy that is my personal and uh, unflinching belief that we need to do that thing today so how do we start looking at identifying the species they already is very traditional species that india is home to whether it is sitafal or ramphal or bird or jamun all these kind of species tamarind all these things are home i mean india is home to these are our principal crops so now how do we take up research on these aspects and strengthen those things uh, to be grown more robustly under the dry land horticulture so i think friends we have a great future in the horticulture domain and india has realized that and it's only because of this that under the atmanirbhar bharat there is greater focus on post harvest management under the agriculture infrastructure fund while that aif is meant for all kinds of agriculture sectors both agriculture but both agronomic and horticulture crops but obviously horticulture will need more and will use it more whether it is the micro food processing to upgrade the technology through the ministry of food processing industries and industries at rupees 10000 crore is mostly going to be used once again for processing in the industry relating to horticulture so there is, you will find that every single thing there is so much of scope that you have and i would suggest that we can all look at taking forward horticulture uh, 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 from various aspects including as i said that it can help in carbon sequestration today the carbon is there in the air but not in the soil if we are able to actually grow a lot of perennial trees including horticulture species then we'll be able to sequester that excess carbon dioxide is there is there in the air in the atmosphere and put it back to the soil where it is actually uh, required so i will not take further time there's certainly lot to speak about horticulture but i can say only that that government of india under the ministry of agriculture inclusive of the indian agriculture research institute i'm so indian council of agriculture research icar which is our primary engine and the department of agriculture which is meant for extension we are working together redesigning the policies reorienting everything over to ensure that we are able to take horticulture uh, on, on this progressive step forward the last point that i would like to tell you is since we are small and marginal farmers since our productivity i mean production is small in nature the the aggregate the loss the, the the produce is disaggregated so if we want that to be connected with the market it is very important for us that we create aggregation points 
So through the Grameen Agriculture Markets, our aim is to create these aggregation law pools where we have all facilities, including cold stores of appropriate size. And then the farmers are able to aggregate their produce, supported, of course, by the farmer producer organizations. And then thereafter, integrate to the agriculture value chain either through the APMCs or on the direct trade platform. So we, what we are seeing today is that policy reform supported by infrastructure and supported by the changes in the extension methodology, all these things will actually be a, a, a good game to make this horticulture a good game. So I will stop here. I would once again like to thank the Institute headed by Dr. Srinivas, and I would like to thank our DDG, Dr. Anil Kumar Singh, and all the scientists and everybody of the family of IIHR for giving me this privilege. I consider this as a privilege that you have given me to be with you and speak with you. I really wish that I had been able to come down physically, but I could not come because I have been tasked with some important responsibility over the time being. But next time I'm at Bangalore, I will be certainly there at IIHR and like to uh, spend time with you and learn all that you people are doing, because I think knowledge is something is a continuum. We need to continuously learn, continuously learn from others and from the Institute. And I look forward to learning from IIHR. So thank you very much. And once again, I pay my respects to all the former directors of IIHR, all the former DDGs of horticulture in the ICAR. Not done so much. I mean, it's very easy to talk of horticulture now. 10 years back, 15 years back, 20 years back, when people did not bother for horticulture, they were lone voices. Though we had the first National Horticulture Board in 1984, and then it was restructured as a, a National Horticulture Mission and Himnesh to finally become the MIDH in 2015, it has been a long and steady progress. And all of this is possible only because two people have been able to convince the government that this is the future of our country. So thank you very much. And I wish you the very best and wish all the families Godspeed, good health, and please take care uh, during, <laughs> during the time of uh, Corona, which is still hanging around. So Namaskar and Jai Hind. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, uh, before the other people start, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Really, it was a great, inspiring lecture for many of us. In fact, I have heard you several times and I have spent with you in the ministry for four, four years. And it's really one of those eye openers for many of us who are working in the field of horticulture. Thank you for that presentation, sir. It was a great honor for us to having invited you on this platform. And I look forward to you for your physical presence at the earliest, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shiva. Thank you, Shiva. Thank you.